Hello everyone, welcome to the 12th annual Global Ivy Day. My name is Mazi Raz, I'm the Director of Learning Design and Strategy at the Ivy Academy. I'm an MBA grad of 2005 and PhD 2014. It is my honor and privilege to be with you as the host of this session. I'd like to begin by reminding us of the land on which Ivy Business School is sitting and to think about the way we are positioned in that land today. We acknowledge that Ivy Business School and Western University are located on traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Arawandaroon, and Lenapewik peoples on lands connected with London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796. And the dish with one spoon common in Rampu, this land continues to be home to diverse indigenous peoples whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors of our society. Global Ivy Day is about reconnecting with colleagues and classmates and with Ivy community at large. It is also about recollecting, reminding ourselves what it means to be an Ivy graduate and the pledge we made to contribute to the societies in which we live. Finally, Global Ivy Day is about celebrating. And this year's theme is about celebrating globality. Of course, one may wonder about the appropriateness of celebrating in these difficult and dark periods. For instance, we are well into the second year of the COVID-19 pandemic and in many parts of the world, the path out of the pandemic has suffered a massive setback. India is facing disaster, its health system is collapsing, and the numbers of newly infected cases and deaths are exponentially increasing. The hospitals are running out of beds and supplies or oxygen are running short. Today, we're celebrating globality as a reminder of our connectedness and that human beings are members of a whole. Through this reminder, we can work to bring hope and jubilation in everyone's lives. In today's sessions and panel discussions, we're accompanied by three brilliant, lively guests. I'm thrilled to introduce a good friend and mentor of mine, Dr. Nicole Haggerty, Associate Professor at Ivy. Nicole is a HBA grad of 89 and PhD 2004. Welcome, Nicole. We also have us, uh, Michael Tambley, a graduate of Ivy, EMBA 2008. Michael is the president and CEO of Akutun Kobo. Welcome, Michael. Last but not least, we are with Fenton Jegio. Fenton is HP of 2016. Fenton is the co-founder of faculty, a platform of self-expression and reimagining grooming. Fenton is also the youngest ever commissioner to sit on the board of TTC, one of the largest public transit systems in North America. Welcome, welcome Fenton. In a minute or two, we will get more fully acquainted with our guests and our panelists. This live stream event is produced and directed by my colleagues at the Ivy Academy, Sean Ackland Grant and Melissa Welch. Sean is online with us and guide us with Zoom features. Sean, why don't you remind the audience about the interactive features of this session? Sure, thanks Mazi. Welcome everyone, bienvenue. Thank you for joining us again on this special Global Ivy Day broadcast. We know we have viewers tuned in from all around the world. And as always, we encourage you to participate in the session through the chat and the Q&A. You can double click those two icons in the bottom of your window to share ideas and ask questions. Actually, to get us started right now, we'll ask everyone to type in the chat and tell us where you're tuned in from. You'll also see a live transcript option, which is enabled by default. If you'd like to enable or disable captions, uh, click on that icon to show more options. We're also going to ask a couple of poll questions on the challenges you and your organization face in becoming more global. If you're on a mobile device, uh, you may not see those questions appear, but we'll share the results by email along with our follow-up blog article and the full session recording. Thanks again. Let's get into it. Back to you, Mazi. Thank you, Sean. Friends, uh, the title of today's live stream is How Canadian Companies Can Activate Global Connectedness. Canada certainly does not suffer from a lack of creative ideas and innovative individuals. In fact, because of Canada's diverse workforce, we can expect more colorful business ideas and innovative services or products that are deemed valuable. We do, however, sense that Canada <clears throat> has possibly experiencing certain difficulties in scaling up globally. For the most part, most of our ideas remain quite local. There could be many reasons for this. For example, not many ideal models for competition or for benchmarking, challenges related to IP protection for innovative ideas, difficulty in partnering with other institutions who are willing to, uh, to collaborate, and of course, the general attitude around success and subsequently a relatively lukewarm appetite for being global. The central question we aim to explore today is this. 
In the context of scaling up innovation, what would it mean for Canadian businesses to be global? And here's a provocation. Before we get too busy with different reactions to the post question, might it be useful to open up what, it, what we mean by being global? I'd like to suggest we see being global from three different angles. First, this is the simplest and perhaps the most exhausted meaning, that is being international. From this angle, being global concerns with challenges and economic benefits of crossing national borders or geographies. The second meaning of being global is connected to the natural habitat of humankind, our globe and the planet Earth in general. Here we can and we should trace business activities that relate human social activities and natural environments as a whole. The third meaning and one that I think might interest us the most is considering globality as the quality of being involved in enriching social relations. Being global isn't just about finding through lines and common denominators, but developing and maintaining the ability to encompass differences. It means that tribes, races, gender expressions, ethnicities, indigeneity, and nations do exist, and that to smooth over them is to lose something rich in the human condition. Put differently, globality as an awareness that constitutes the society primarily by its inclusive human framework, rather than distinct geographies or borders. So before we get to the live stream and the conversations that we have with the discussant, let us hear from, from you, our participants, let, let us get a sense of what you think about globality. So Sean is about to launch a poll and the poll is gonna ask a question that says, from your experience, when you think about globality, tackling which one of the following critical aspects would afford your organization to look wider and scale up across the globe? Let's spend a few seconds and think about the question and pick that one critical choice. Great, so the poll is live now and uh, we'll leave it open for a few moments so that folks have a chance to uh, submit their answers. Our, our panelists should also have the opportunity to vote. Any uh, early reactions to those, to those options we're seeing? Oh, Michael, you're on mute. There we go, somebody had to do it. Um, <laughs> certainly when we were looking at uh, at going global, at starting to expand outside of Canada, the biggest question was access to capital. Was you know, do we have do we have gas in the tank to take a model that we built here in the Canadian market, and how quickly could we get it to uh, as many different countries as possible? And that wasn't about innovation. That wasn't about lack of will. It wasn't about uh, lack of desire. It was it was just about do we have the money to make it happen. So we've got uh, about 75% of the audience have, have voted now. So we'll close and share the results, which interestingly, capital investment is one of the answers, but we're seeing a, a fairly even distribution across. across. That, that certainly is interesting. And I can see, um, of course, this, this poll, perhaps it was created in a way to produce this result. I mean, more, different people in different parts of their uh, organization and in different uh, periods of the organization's maturity, they may actually have different uh, exp uh, different challenges and overcoming those is something that perhaps on their mind. Let us uh, explore these. And, and to do that, we'll return to our um, to our panelists here. Uh, why don't I start, why don't I continue with Michael? Michael, you had some, some really good thoughts about some of the challenges of, of, going, uh, of um, scaling up innovation and, and the notion of globality. Let's hear from you, and perhaps uh, if you don't mind sharing with the part, with with the audience here, what do you actually do in your business? And and um, that'll be fantastic to hear from you. Sure, I, Kobo is one of the world's largest e-reading platforms. We sell eBooks and e-readers in 150 countries every week. We have about 45 million users around the world. And so we're based in Toronto, but have operations across Asia, the Americas and Europe. And we have our revenue fairly evenly split between North and South America, Europe, and Asia. And that's because from the beginning, we knew that uh, although we were based in Canada, it kind of just wasn't big enough as a market to support both our ambitions and the kind of scale that we knew would be necessary to compete. So we knew we were going to have to build a global platform. We knew we would be competing against uh, the giants of tech. 
And so a, a question for us was how do we create differentiation? While a lot of our, uh, our competitors were fighting over the US market, we moved very quickly to expand around the world. And uh, one of the ways that we did that, one of the ways that we created differentiation was by not trying to treat every country the same, by uh, not treating this as purely a platform problem that was about you know, how can I create a replicable, replicable experience that treats every country identically. Uh, we did it by partnering locally, by embracing what was different about each of the territories that we were in, hiring people with local expertise, and embracing difference at the same time as we were trying to uh, embrace globality. And so that idea of trying to contain multitudes is something that's baked into the company, not just in terms of what we sell, you know, which is, I think about six and a half million books in the catalog, um, tens of millions of books sold every year, um, and not just in terms of the languages that we encompass. I think we have books in 96 languages that we sell now, but also in the people who we've brought into the organization and the diversity of territories that we operate in. That's beautiful and fantastic. Michael, I'm curious, of the, um, the wisdom to respect and recognize the differences of, of the, um, the parts of the globe that you were trying to reach. How did you come by that wisdom? Was that something that um, through experimentation or through past experiences that you got to? I think it, it came first of all from, uh, from having some people in the company who had a degree of international exposure already, who didn't uh, come in presupposing that a North American perspective was going to be a European perspective or was going to be an Asian perspective. And then those very first hires, those very first employees that we found in each of those local markets, and being opening to listen to that input to, uh, to say, here's, here's how the Netherlands is different. Here's how a French reader is different from a German reader. Here's how a person who loves literature in Italy is different than a person who reads books every day in Japan. Mm -hmm. And, um, being open and aware to that, and also just making sure that those first people that come into the organization can be advocates for uh, for that territory, it can help to reflect the needs of users in that place. That's, that's fantastic and beautiful. Thank you. Uh, Fenton, um, from my understanding of your business, you are in the business of allowing individuals um, to be more creative and self-expressive. And, and to do that, uh, there's a certain degree of respect that is required uh, for the individuality, uh, and as opposed to thinking that uh, one model fits for everyone. In your business, and from, from that point of view, how do you see globality? Yeah, totally, Mazzy. And it's really interesting because when, when Michael talks about globality, he's talking about it from a classic definition of what it means to be global and what it means to understand the context in which different international players are able to coexist. At faculty, which for context is a, is a modern grooming company, but when you strip away all the marketing, what it really is, is our play at driving cosmetics towards a market that has never used cosmetics historically before, and that's the male audience. When we think about that, globality for me means one thing in particular, and bear with me because I'm going to get super philosophical about it, but I, I promise to bring it back down into, in, into reality. Globality comes from this idea that you can deepen the consciousness and see the whole world around you, and it's almost a way to describe globalization. And what that truly means is this idea of being multidisciplinary when it comes to tackling challenges, when it comes to thinking about your business, and depending on the industry that you are involved in, especially one that hasn't changed for over 100 years, i.e. the cosmetics industry, think about how that playbook completely shifts, right? So for, for faculty, there's a couple of things that are really interesting. We are a business that's trying to shift cultural norms, and we have a tough job. We're trying to build a community of people who are interested in self-expression, who are unconcerned with gendered consumption, and who are more concerned with being themselves. We're effectively trying to create a new market. And the problem for that is within the world of cosmetics, a half a trillion dollar industry that has existed for almost a hundred years, that playbook that already exists, it just doesn't work for us. We have to throw it out because we're catering to a completely different market. So knowing that arena that we play in, 
and thinking about globality as this mindset of understanding different disciplines that come together to problem solve, to create new solutions, and to build on this definition of innovation, which is the creation or crystallization of um, something new and something viable, we have to come up with our own playbook. So how do we take awesome tropes and concepts from the world of technology and incorporate it into how we acquire customers? How do we look at the world of fashion and streetwear and hype culture and try to find ways to get guys into our funnel? How do we learn from the systems in agriculture that exist on supply chain and try to incorporate into the way that we build our products? And it's that idea of thinking across disciplines and throwing out the classic playbook that I think is so crucial to this idea of globality, which I think, and I was, I was you know, doing some research on the definition because Globality to me seems like a bit of a made up word, but it comes from a sociologist based out of Britain um, called Roland Robertson. And effectively what he defines it as is the intersection or the intensification of consciousness. So being able to take from these different industries to build a new playbook, to help drive success, drive innovation and create a long lasting ROI for your business. Fenton, I'm detecting um, a sense of unlearning in, in some of the um, comments that you're making and some of the um, uh, ideas that you're sharing with us, is that if we have been having certain uh, mindsets, uh, we may have to go through a process of unlearning them as we are thinking about globality. And you also raised a series of questions um, that are I suspect the questions that are best not answered immediately, that we can consider those questions as um, perhaps guideposts going forward and always keeping them. And this is a, this is a really uh, an interesting way of looking at um, thinking about the path forward and being global through those questions uh, that will guide us and perhaps we should not rush into answering them. That, that's very fascinating. Nicole, you are in a practice of um, turning minds. You're in a practice of enriching people's lives through education. And I know that you have been uh, not only interacting with people from all over the world through, through your practices, both in research and, and teaching, but also recently you took on an, um, this, this new role of um, Ivy's, uh, the first initiative that has had with Africa. Uh, tell us a little bit more about your experiences and from your point of view, what do you think globality is? Thanks, Mazi. Um, I love being on this panel. So thank, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me here because I want to pick up on uh, something that Benton um, mentioned talking about an academic. Um, and that is the idea of the intensification of consciousness. Um, you know, I have always thought of myself as a, a, an entrepreneur of, of ideas. Um, and so my work, uh, my work really reflects on globality in two ways. On the research side, uh, I've spent years looking at how um, the different tribes of business managers and technologists, right, the IT people, how those tribes create um, paths to value uh, leveraging technology. And so interestingly, at that microcosm level, of course, it's not necessarily dealing in different countries, except that managers and technologists seem to come from different planets um, when it comes to how they come together and, and uh, create value from innovation. But on the teaching side, I think that's where I've had uh, the most opportunity to think about globality um, and, and how we need to prepare our students for uh, two things, intensification of their own consciousness and an appreciation of their place in the world in a way that is uh, expansive, while also being um, while also being humble and opening up their capacity to see. And I want to talk about um, the the continent of Africa in particular. I noticed in the chat as I was watching uh, the screen blow up of where people are at that we have uh, somebody from South Africa, um, and there may be others with uh, you know a background if not currently located there, but a, a background on that continent. Um, and here's what I'd say uh, that I started to encounter. Um, you know, the, the purpose of the um, curriculum innovation I created, the Ubuntu Management Education Initiative, was um, there was many different um, goals of that. One was a realization that our colleagues um, from business schools on the continent of Africa, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, had a desire to embrace experiential learning and case-based education 
uh, and that we had a role to play maybe in supporting that, in collaborating with them to support it. And the second piece of that, that was uh, uh, an important recognition is, we don't have a lot of cases about Africa, <laughs> uh, about business and about entrepreneurship on that continent. And that creates a major blind spot for our school and for our students because we don't talk about it. Um, and not only do we not talk about it, we are, uh, let's say, inframed by a single story of, uh, of the continent. Um, the author, uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, and uh, a great um, economist named Dambiza Moyo both talk about this issue of, you know, outside of the continent, most people have a very single story of that continent. And the consequence is, is that um, we, we tend to approach um, understanding these differences and opportunities from a very narrow frame of reference, right? Which is about poverty and war and, and you know, starvation. What we, and that precludes us from having a lens of seeing opportunity, uh, of seeing, um, you know, sort of a, a thriving business community, of seeing, you know, a lot of uh, local innovation that we could import here. Uh, and we approach it therefore as a business opportunity from a very particular kind of narrowed, objectified mindset. So the, the program I run um, allows Ivy students not just to, um, well, allows Ivy students to first of all, break open and break down that single story uh, through the conversations that we have. And then also to, um, it, when, to when, uh, pandemics permit to travel and, and go there. This year, we're actually doing it virtually. So my students are working with African students and African business schools uh, using Zoom technology. Um, and, and that partnership allows them to develop new case material, but also show how to learn from cases. And those cases are all about African businesses. So, you know, that's sort of the work I do. Um, and it, it is all predicated on using the Ivy Classroom to open up the world. Hmm. Beautiful. Thank you, Nicole. Um, as I'm listening to all three of you, I'm getting a sense that um, we, our starting point here in this conversation has been um, a respect and a recognition of differences. And as we are thinking about going um, be, being global, that's one place to start. But it also, to me, that raises a question that is um, simultaneously philosophical and practical, is that how do we, connect with these differences? How do we find um, a way or a perhaps means of, of, of reaching to and connecting? Recognizing exactly what you just said, uh, Nicole, is that we may not have had a great deal of experience and, or, or, some, or, or conversely, we may actually have had some stereotypical understanding of, of, of these differences. How do we overcome these stereotypes? And how do we practically figure out a way of connecting to these, difference, uh, to, to these differences? Maybe, um, Fenton, um, um, any, any thoughts or any ideas about this question? Have you ever heard of the term radical curiosity? Radical curiosity for me is this relentless desire to go down what I'm calling this productive rabbit hole, to learn, to understand, to empathize, and to get knowledge under your skin in a particular topic that you may not be completely versed in. Now, radical curiosity, if used correctly, can do one of two things. The first thing that it can do is it can really help you create connections to your daily life, from how you work to what you're, where you're operating in, and relate that back to the business innovation that you're trying to build, right? And the second thing that radical curiosity will allow you to do is continue to build connections in spaces that you might not have ever dreamed of building connections. So how are those applicable? I think the first thing is for, for a company like faculty, and I'll, and I'll tell a very brief story that walks through why radical curiosity is so important. But when we were thinking about our launch in July of last year, the first product that we were going to launch was a concealer. All right. A concealer is a makeup product. And the reason why we wanted to launch it was because it's got the highest demand amongst men and lowest barrier to entry. The problem, which many of the audience members have pointed out, is that there are certainly some large capital constraints when launching makeup products and even launching from a global perspective. So we thought, well, damn, we can't launch this because it's tough. What can we launch instead? And I remember reading a GQ article and seeing nail polish 
on, on one of my favorite celebrities hands. And I was like, huh, that's really interesting. I don't know anything about nail polish. I don't know anything about nail products, but this could be an interesting angle. And we got deep into it. We understood it. We got the cultural relevance. We learned the significance of guys wearing nail polish, its history from the world of punk to now as a movement for self-expression. And we ended up pivoting the entire product suite, starting with nail polish. And that was arguably one of the best things that we have ever done. But we wouldn't have known that if we just trusted conventional wisdom. We wouldn't have known that if we trusted what we saw in the industry to be true and followed that exact same playbook. So radical curiosity, this rabbit hole that you can go down based on a couple of really great Easter eggs that point you into a path of possible success can be so great and can be so important. And now from a people perspective, you're building connections all the time. You're driving relationships. You're learning more. And at the end of your journey and learning experience, you end up having this portfolio of people who you can rely on and who you can work with to help build the business in whatever capacity you choose. So be curious and be radically curious and always challenge convention and challenge what you do because chances are you don't know everything. Fenton, uh, I suspect this this notion of radical curiosity that you are um, mentioning. By the way, I loved this idea of productive rabbit hole, and I can totally see that I'm going to be using that term so many times from now on. But but the, this this notion of radical curiosity, I suspect it is highly related to what you said a little earlier about this intensified um, uh, consciousness and and heightened awareness. It is one thing, I mean, in the world of, um, of learning, I'm always um, constantly asking myself the question, how do I help people be different or be who they want to be? Can I just simply stand in front of a classroom or in a boardroom or in, in, on, on a subway and tell someone that be curious? I suspect that doesn't work. So, so what are the ways that we could help people develop this radical curiosities in them? In your experience, what are the ways for us to ignite that curiosity in them? Any any thoughts or any ideas based on your experiences here? Yeah, totally, Mazzy. And, and you're right. I think I think you know we're, we're not all pundits in everything, and it's hard for us to sit on a subway. And I can tell you that firsthand and tell someone to be curious because it just wouldn't work out. But I, I think there are a couple of ways that you can use radical curiosity as a muscle, and it truly is a muscle that has to be developed over time. I think the first thing is what are you reading, and most people would argue that you should be reading concepts, ideas, the future of insert your favorite industry that's related to you because you want to be an expert in that industry. I actually want to challenge that convention and strike up, strike up another method. What are you reading outside of your industry, outside of your business line, outside of your way of operating that helps contribute to your development and subsequently your company's development? And how through those readings... How are you connecting that back to the business that you run on an everyday basis? So it's, it's a function of two things, I think. It's one, how are you exposing yourself to new ideas, reading amazing things, looking at documentaries if you are not a reading person, and exploring things that are completely outside of your comfort zone? And how are you making the conscious connections back to your industry? And how can you take a little bit of that knowledge and relate it back to what you're doing? Right. And, and this is like your your classic toolkit for driving innovation is thinking about the different industries and adjacencies that sit around where you sit and trying to bring a little bit of that into where you operate as a way to be constructive. So you've got to be reading, you've got to be learning outside of your industry, and you have to be comfortable knowing that when you are engaging with these different topics, you're not going to know everything. But that's the point of this. That's very interesting. Michael, I suspect that um, uh, Fenton's invitation to people to read differently and widely is something that perhaps you would enjoy hearing about. Uh, music to my ears. <laughs> music to your ears. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts or your concerns uh, about um, how to connect with other human beings, recognizing and respecting differences, but at the same time, reaching out and connecting? I'm for me, there it's this it's this really interesting mix that I think needs to be cultivated when you're starting to sort of link, come out of your out of your business comfort zone at this this odd mix of humility and fearlessness. And the fearlessness part is kind of easy. Like the you know so much of a business education is kind of about jamming a certain level of fearlessness into people, giving them a set of tools that make them feel that they can accomplish anything. 
whether or not they actually can. And, uh, and then you know, that's what propels you forward. Um, but, the, but balancing that with a sense of knowing that you don't know everything, being open to ask the question, being able to kind of create some vulnerability within your own organization so that people feel okay about asking those questions, about digging a little bit deeper, about trying to uncover the subtleties of a particular market or the needs of a particular customer. The, you know, one of the things that I think we push and pull on a lot in innovation-driven economies is you know, we, you know, we overemphasize the fearlessness and the idea that we can create universal solutions for problems. You know, that's kind of, that is that engineering mindset. We'll find one way and then we'll be able to roll it out across the world. And the, the humility part is how you pick up the nuance, is how you find the places that it doesn't fit. And there can be a ton of opportunity in, um, in both being aware of it and being able to encompass it. I guess the other, the other piece that I think we found important is, is a certain amount of institutional resilience uh, that over the course of trying to be open to new ideas about trying to go into new places that people haven't been, uh, mistakes are gonna get made, you're going to take hits, it is going to be hard. Um, if you knew how, how hard it was gonna be, you probably wouldn't do it. And <laughs> the, um, and so can you, can you build some of that grit into the company uh, so that people can shake off a setback and then get back to that sense of um, what more can we know and how can we get better? And so I think you, you, know, you take that, you mix that with the radical curiosity that, uh, that Fenton's talking about, and you end up with this really interesting toolkit of being able to go into places that you haven't been trained for. You end up going into markets that you don't know much about um, and be able to start learning. And, uh, and then from that learning, find ways that you can create value. We, we should be charging for this, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Totally agree. I totally agree. <laughs> uh, there, there's something really fascinating that you mentioned, Michael, uh, about making sure that uh, we don't only see innovation through the engineering lens. Uh, and, and with full respect to all engineers out there, I mean, the world would, would not have actually been so beautiful without engineers. But the idea of that, that one solution fits all, right? And, and it's something that um, there are some, some scholars and researchers actually talking about the approach that Silicon Valley has these days is that for, for every app, there's a, sorry, for every solution, there is an app. And if you really want to solve the world problem, press this one button and everything will disappear. You're challenging that and you're suggesting that no nuances matter. And, and paying attention to those nuances are precisely what's necessary to um, develop that, global, uh, that globality or the global mindset. It's, it's interesting because it was one of the greatest challenges that we had while raising funds for Kobo in the early days. You know, we, did, you know, we did the Sand Hill Road uh, tour raising venture capital and the, and the hope was, and you could see it in the eyes of every VC that you sat down with. It's like, okay, you've got, you've got a piece of software, you've got something and we're just gonna be able to sell like a lot of it with a small number of employees to a you know, hundred million people. And the answer was, well, actually these countries are all kind of different. They're all gonna require a slightly different solution to kind of make it work. Um, we, think we, can, we think we can do that in an efficient way, but it's not one master solution to own them all. And that's the only way that we can make ourselves different than Amazon, Apple, Google. Like that's actually how you win against a company like that. And, uh, uh, and Frankly, like a lot of investors just found that too scary to, uh, to go after. The ones that said yes, in the end, we're pretty happy that they did. Beautiful. Nicole, being a scholar of um, information technology and the whole of uh, the world that is around that, um, I suspect that Michael's point of view and approach is something that um, you've encountered in, in research uh, and in the work that you do. Am I correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh... Yeah, I, I was busy thinking about the other thing that they were talking about, but I will let me pick up on this because, you know, I think, you know, the interesting thing about uh, um, 
technology is yeah. that people see uh, the surface, which is, the, you know, here's a piece of technology, and they don't understand the deep structure of the path to value creation through management capability, right? Um, and that management capacity to say, you know, yeah, we may have a piece of technology, but how it interacts with its social conditions in any given market matters. And so that nuance and uh, pulling out the um, uh, sort of unique managerial approach, even given sort of a common idea of a reader, right, with books, that is where unique value is created, right? Mm -hmm. That is the place where unique value is created. And um, that's a managerial challenge more than it is a technological challenge. And so the point I want to pick up on um, that I heard from both my colleagues here, Fenton and Michael, is the journey towards a global a globality as a mindset, right, starts with the interior um, mindset of the individual, right? There's an interior learning that has to take place inside the individual. And, um, you know, for Fenton, what I heard was it starts with reading, reading outside, right, of, of where you're at. And with Michael, it starts with being in a geography and figuring it out. Um, there's a certain amount of, uh, you talked about grit and resilience, Michael. When I think about how do we bring that into the Ivy classroom, right? So that's what I hear, that's what motivates me, that motivated my own journey. It started with a TED talk, sorry, but it started with a TED talk. Um, uh, this, I, I mentioned the author, uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie uh, has a TED talk. I, I implore you all to watch it, The Danger of a Single Story. If you've not read, watched it, watch it. Here's why, I start my course with that. I start, uh, I start many conversations with it, clearly this one being a one hate to plug a TED talk, but it's a pathway in, into the inside of what is my single story, right? The first thing it does, and the first thing I use it for is to challenge people to think about the single story we have of a whole continent, the continent of Africa, and the danger that harboring that single story has for how we, our capacity to even see difference, to, to even, our capacity to even see opportunity. But it also affords an opportunity for us to be reflective on our own single story, right? What is the single story of me that other people have? The single story others have of my organization, of uh, cosmetics for men. Like, what are the single stories people have that how do I break down those single stories? And I think for IB students, the work that I do is focused on two things because it's also been my own journey personally. That is humility, right? The, the character attribute of humility is about being reflective, uh, being open, uh, open-minded, and being a perpetual learner, right? To be able to see when am I not, not, not um, you know, making things visible, not accounting for the single perspectives I might have. And the other is collaboration, um, because collaboration brings cooperation and interconnectedness. And you put those two things together right, and, and facilitate the discovery of those things in our, in our students, in ourselves, then you've got the right interior platform for an exterior approach to globality and interconnectedness. Uh, you make me want to come to your class next time around and, and actually take your course, because these are lessons that um, I very much would like to um, hear uh, get involved with and practice on an ongoing basis, Nicole. So I'll make sure that I'll figure out a way of um, uh, enrolling in your course. You're uh, welcome anytime, Mazzy. <laughs> Everyone's welcome. I have a dream of uh, an, an alumni based collaboration with these African business schools because it is a unique capability of the Ivy community to use the experiential case based method, right? And to engage in conversations about business from uh, that platform. So alumni program, here we come. There we go, fantastic. Um, Michael, the question that um, it, it has been on my mind, I mean, we're really talking about some very interesting um, human aspects and, and really we're lifting the hood and truly looking at what's underneath this notion of being global and, and, the, and, uh, and uh, embracing curiosity, uh, humility, collaborations for the purpose of being global. As an executive, as someone who's been really um, experienced, uh, highly experienced and successful in this world, what 
uh, advice do you have for people who are uh, about to embark on this journey? Uh, what are some, some words of wisdom that you may want to share with them? Um, I think one of the most important things that we did um, was that we looked at the idea of being an international company with intention. Uh, and there were so many decisions that we made very early on before they were commercially relevant, before it was going to turn into revenue that allowed us to, um, to not just be a North American company, to not just be a Canadian company. And they, they felt like expensive dangerous, risky decisions at the time. You know, as soon as you decide to support multiple languages, as soon as you decide to do multi-locale, like everything slows down. Yeah, you know, everything becomes more complicated. You just kind of, you take on a lot of engineering baggage. You take on a lot of logistical baggage, but uh, it, was, it was absolutely the thing that determined whether or not we were standing here today. We made those decisions early on. A lot of our competitors said, the US, it's the, you know, it's the largest market for ebooks in the world. That's where we're going to spend all of our time. And so that allowed us to move to every other country where it looked like uh, digital reading might have a chance of taking root very quickly. And it bought us two years of running time. It allowed us time to build market share. It allowed us time to find customers and build brand and, and kind of build loyalty. But it started with, these really rugged, gnarly conversations at the beginning. It's like, this is gonna be painful until it starts to, until it starts to pay off. But if we hadn't, we would have been like a lot of our competitors kind of locked in a single language, single territory world, and then trying to figure out afterwards, how do we get out? Um, and realizing that then it's even more difficult and more expensive. And in the meantime, everything we were doing from a people perspective, everything we were doing from kind of a, a philosophical perspective was based around this idea that we're trying to encompass a world of reading. We're not just trying to be a great Canadian digital bookseller. Um, it was that you know, there, there were really going to be four or five global platforms that are going to dominate the space and that we could coming out of Toronto actually be one of them. Wow. Yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's beautiful. And I agree with Fenton. We actually should start charging for this. Um, these are some really good <laughs> words of wisdom for people. Yes, we should. Uh, Fenton, um, there's a question that is coming from the audience, and, and I'm actually quite curious about this as well. Um, there is something really unique about your experience, and that is that you're not just very uh, interestingly global, but you're also connecting with um, and perhaps simultaneously building a non-existent conventional marketplace. It wasn't out there. It's not something that you're like stepping into a market that was well-defined with parameters of success and whatnot. You actually had to define it. And, and in that experience, um, would you be willing to share some of your uh, key learning with people? Oh yeah, C -cer certainly, Mazzy. And it's been, it's been an anthropological journey to say the least. I, I feel like I feel like I am I'm an explorer trying to understand this new audience that I'm trying to build that could be seen as an adjacent audience or one that doesn't exist or what have you. So when we think about finding our customers, we think about generations and we think about where that generation lives, where they exist, where they eat, where they breathe. And for us, the primary target for our business is Gen Z. I'm, you know, I, I have the misfortune of being a millennial. So we are the, we're the talk of the town and the class clowns, but Gen Z is a whole new market that thinks critically about the businesses that they're interested in. They think critically about the environment, social causes. They own $140 billion worth of buying power in the U S and that's going to globally scale over time. And they're looking for businesses that lead with intention, as Michael said, that are authentic, that come with a true purpose and a value and a philosophy that they align with. So where do they, where do they live and, and where do you find them? And quite frankly, you know, whether, whether we like to see the pandemic as something that's limited us in terms of our globalization, it's actually been quite helpful to learning and to understanding this new perspective. It means I can go onto the world of Instagram and look at the cultural leaders who are dominating the space and dominating the culture that we look up to, see the people who are following them and go down that rabbit hole 
and find those like-minded people. And when you start to get a sample size of 100, 200 people of who you're analyzing on a constant basis, you start to see a couple of things that are, are predominant pillars within that generation. And then you can start to find these people everywhere, right? Another great way that we try to find our customers is through the content we put out. We try to put out amazing content that speaks to people. And the people who it speaks to will engage in discussion, in conversation, and we can learn from them. And we're constantly talking to this generation in one way, shape, or form, whether it's through these interviews or conversations or through the world of TikTok or Instagram or social media. And quite frankly, some of this stuff means that we have to go outside too. And, and, and I believe that in a world where we get back to what's normal, we're, 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 going, to the, we're going to the parades. We are, we're going to the hot spots where people hang out. We're having conversations with them. And getting back to that whole ethnographic research and an anthropological journey, we're really, we're really just trying to witness and view it all happening right before our eyes. So that, that, that's sort of the surface level approach. So that's radical curiosity in practice. Exactly. Lived and embodied. That's beautiful. Thank you. Uh, Sean, um, I, we, we don't want to keep this conversation only amongst uh, the four of us here. Uh, let's bring in some of the, uh, uh, our audience questions in. Any, any interesting questions that you see that uh, perhaps we could tackle? Yeah, there, there are a few here, actually. Michael, you had, you had mentioned you know, one of the keys to, to the early stages of your uh, business journey was, was not treating uh, you know, your approach as a one-size-fits-all around the technology. So Scott from the audience is actually asking whether you had to do any specific uh, you know, market tailoring of the core technology, or was it really all about adapting to your different market entry approaches? We did. Um, so there were, there are a couple of places where, and I look at reading culture specifically, that, uh, that we really got pulled in different directions, depending on the territory that we're in. Um, I look at the difference between, say, our Canadian market and our Japanese market. Uh, Japan's a huge territory for us, and uh, uh, and yet in Canada, let's say two thirds of uh, two thirds of the reading is happening on e-readers on dedicated devices that we've you know, that we've manufactured and sold. In Japan, almost everything is smartphone. Um, yeah, e-readers not a product category at all, and that didn't just mean that we had to have a really good experience for smartphone for, uh, for e-reading. That's something that we had to do everywhere. But we found that um, the reading culture there is almost entirely graphic novels and manga. So about 60% of what we sell in Japan is illustrated content, is graphic novels, and that the expectations around how you view that are incredibly high. So we would have uh, publishers turning us inside out to make sure that the way that we rendered images had absolute fidelity to the paper product that they were selling on newsstands every day. Uh, the speed and the rate at which people could like, zip through uh, manga at this ferocious pace uh, was something that we had never experienced anywhere else. And then the rapidity at which they were expecting recommendations, new books, get me to the next in the series, move me through this particular genre, or this particular artist, were things that we'd never encountered before. So like one capsule example of just one reading culture very different from other ones that we've seen. We have other places where the, the challenges are regulatory. Um, you can't discount a book in France. Uh, you have to, like everybody has to sell them at the same price. It's the law. So all of this beautifully elaborate price management, you know, discount curve sensitivity and stuff that we built for other territories suddenly went out the window when you're really competing on experience. So like, Two examples of uh, you know, two what looked to be very straightforward countries that actually required us to kind of rip apart big parts of the product and think about them differently. And yet still, even the technological differences in how you were delivering the product ultimately grew out of an understanding of the culture and, and sort of the, the needs of the local consumer. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Um, we're, we're also seeing uh, quite a bit of chat and some suggestions. Nicole, perhaps you could do an MOOC on this idea of, of globality and uh, interior environment. So maybe we'll, we'll try to find a way to connect some of our audience members with our panelists after, uh, after the session and get some of these dialogues continuing. Uh, and, and also tap into the alumni network as, as, as Nicole is suggesting. Yeah, absolutely. 
Love to. I'd love to do a session with uh, the Danger of a Single Story and walk people through the um, conversations that we have that got uh, the students I work with started on the path of uh, both one as it relates to uh, the African continent and the five countries that we work in um, in, in Africa, uh, but also just the opportunity to be reflective and to think about how those single stories play out. I'll tell you something really, really valuable I learned that when we've, we started the conversation looking outward, right? How our single story of the continent of Africa affects the work we might do, how we become more critical and, and uh, more humble in our engagement. But then I turned it around and I had, what I realized was that the essence of globality is right around us. It is it latent in all these people that we work with and the stories they have to tell. And it is within our power to open that up, to expose that if we ask the right questions and take the right moment for reflection. Mm. And Nicole, I'm, I'm probably going to uh, say something a bit controversial here. And if I'm incorrect, please, 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 uh, please correct me. I suspect this notion um, that the that you're raising right now, it just doesn't happen only. Um, with respect to globality and, and across nations, even local, it, it is exceptionally valuable, right? A single story, the danger of the single story. It, it is, is it, yeah. In daily life, not just only, in, not just only from, from a global point of view. A hundred percent. And that is the, that's the moment when I realized that the right, you know, that for the work that we do, the right, that, that is the right video to get us started. But for the opportunity for individuals to sort of open themselves up um, in a really authentic and vulnerable way, their reflection on their own single story and then where else they see single stories playing out, it just, it was probably the most magical two hours of conversation I've had with Ivy students in ever. And I've been doing this for uh, 30, <laughs> 30 plus years. Yeah. Since you were like four or five, perhaps, yeah. Oh, God. God love you, Mazzy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're getting close to the, the hour, and um, perhaps one of the things that we could do right now is return to the audience. And actually, um, Sean, you've prepared a second poll for us as you were listening to um, the, the conversations here. Um, let, let's hear from the audience and get a sense of now that they've heard these dialogues about globality and the whole big picture question about how Canadian companies can activate their global connectedness, what excites them and, and uh, what features about this dialogue uh, they're more attracted to. So here's the, here's the poll. The poll is asking that now that you've heard from our panelists, to which of the following aspects of globality are you more attracted and willing to learn about? It's a multiple choice. So, so um, uh, let's, let's take a moment and, and, um, and answer these questions. Mine would be all of them. Sorry, I'm not going to influence other people's. Uh, I hope I'm not influencing other people's choices, but I'm going to say all. I'm seeing radical curiosity in the lead, Fenton. You you had an impact. <laughs> oh boy, I was I was about to say, Sean Mazza. I hope this isn't a poll to see who was the best panelist. <laughs> I'm staying quiet on this one. <laughs> I'm going to uh, vote for a tie between Fenton and Michael. <laughs> um, okay, we so we'll, we'll end the, the poll here and I'll share the results. Radical Curiosity did actually take the, the lead, but we saw, you know, we, our, our audience was able to vote for multiple options and we saw many people voting for, for many options. So hopefully this uh, conversation has inspired uh, you all to follow up. Excellent. That's fantastic. Um, just uh, maybe another few minutes we have. Um, if, if there's any last uh, words of wisdom that you wish to share with people, that'd be fantastic. Uh, uh, let's, let's go with Fenton first and then Michael, and then we'll uh, return back to Nicole at the end. There, there was an interesting piece that um, Nicole mentioned around innovation having a portion of its scalability coming from management systems. And I wholeheartedly believe that. When I think about innovation, it's broken up into the client side and the people side on the internal. As, as leaders within the community, I, I always implore at the end of these talks to think about your workforce 
and to think about how you can drive inclusion in that workforce and to think about how you can drive a workforce that has that comes from different disciplines because there's so much magic in the brainstorming and the idea creation of people who come from such various backgrounds and having a human lens is proven to show an incredible financial return that shows up on an income statement and is not just a PR plug. So for the sake of radical curiosity, for the sake of innovation, for the sake of going global, do your best to bring in a workforce that represents that. And I promise you, you will be on your way to driving profits like never before. Mm. Thank you. Michael? I think there's a, there's a bit of a tendency in, in Canadian business to, to think modestly, to look at what you know, a, a, a good, nice-sized success would look like. And, um, and so we've, I think there's kind of been a general narrative about how do we inject more of that fearlessness into Canadian innovators and people that are starting new companies in Canada. Um, and, and I absolutely agree with that. And that was the, that was the momentum that powered us forward is that you absolutely could build a global business from Canada, but the humility piece is important too, because that in the end was what allowed us to stick in different markets. It, being Canadian, encompassing diversity, um, not having a legacy of, being an imperial power, being a, you know, kind of being a dominating power was what allowed us to go into territories that really resist that kind of, that kind of legacy in history. So having, you know, having the kind of notional Canadian flag on our lapel was something that allowed us to work in countries and with companies who in many ways were trying to defend themselves against encroachment from other big companies from other places. So embracing that Canadianness as opposed to trying to starch it out and just becoming a slightly colder Silicon Valley is a, is a unique opportunity for us. Can you take all of the virtues of tolerance and diversity and openness that are embedded in this country and power that with the fearlessness that we know that, you know, a great education from somewhere like Ivy can help to inject along with a lot of you know, plain old homegrown ambition. So that's, that's what I would love to see. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Nicole, I know that uh, you also have a lot to share with us, but uh, looking at the time and, and we only have about a minute, um, maybe a, a few words of wisdom. Sorry, Nicole. Love you. <laughs> it's quite all right. And nearly impossible for an Ivy faculty member to keep it to two minutes, but I'll, I'll use one word. Let me leave you with one word. The word is Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a South Bantu word that means I am because we are. Mm -hmm. I am because we are. That is the uh, uh, name we chose for the Ubuntu Management Education Initiative. Um, and it's that spirit of interconnectedness that I encourage um, everyone to find a way to embrace. I am because we are. That's Ubuntu. It's very beautiful, and thank you. Thanks to uh, all of our panelists. Uh, you were amazing, you were lively, you were generous, and um, thank you very much. Sean, uh, perhaps uh, I'll pass it on to you to share with the audience uh, how they can access the recording um, and the follow-up of this uh, live stream. Sure, thanks so much, Mazi, Nicole, Fenton, and Michael. Uh, I enjoyed the conversation and, and it sounds like our audience did uh, very much as well. So to all the folks tuned in, we appreciate you spending some time with us on this Global Ivy Day. There's a lot of great content planned throughout the day, so make sure to visit ivyday.ca for the full schedule. We'll be sending out an emailed link to the full recording on our YouTube channel tomorrow. You can also follow uh, us on YouTube or your favorite social network to get notified of all our latest content. Thanks again for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.